Hello, I'm Bagantia Blackbird of Blackbird's Brew. Happy Monday and welcome to Norse Studies Week 22. This week we are diving into Chapter 7 of the book, Germanic Heathenry, A Practical Guide by James Coulter. And the chapter is titled The Erminic Concept of Spirit. And the author breaks this discussion down into 12 parts. Uh, the soul, the atom, the body, the spirit, the haim, the fetch, the mind, the memory, the wit, the will, the mood, and the woad. And we'll just review this breakdown of concepts uh, one at a time. So the soul. In this section, the author spends uh, most of the text uh, comparing and contrasting different perspectives of what constitutes the soul, very definitional. He looked at actual dictionaries, different theological uh, definitions, both uh, heathen, pagan, and Christian. And I can understand that there is an argument for comparing and contrasting Abrahamic and pagan definitions and their worldviews. Uh, that approach has some value for new students because the differences are not always clear in their minds, uh, let alone intuitively understood. But what irritates me is when pagan books and discussions don't get past that point. Uh, you know, quite frankly, and no matter what your religion is, you should be able to expound upon the concepts, the beliefs, and the practices of that religion without having to reference any other religion at all, ever. And if someone can't do that, then that signals to me that they don't really understand the belief system they claim to practice. It points to inexperience at best and intellectual laziness at worst. And I think our spiritual community can do better. Uh, we do not have to frame our beliefs and our practices against anyone else's, let alone those of Abrahamic religions. It would be a mature step forward for the broader community to just get beyond these very basic levels of discussion. But uh, getting back to the text at the very end of the section about the soul, the author uh, throws in a little sentence about the soul essentially being the animating or life force of the body. I think we could have just said that from the word go. Uh, that brings us to the atom, uh, which is best defined as the electricity that allows physical life to exist, that animating force. And uh, by this reckoning, uh, the soul and the atom is essentially the same thing in the author's eyes. Uh, why we needed two sections of the book to make that clear is not something I pretend to understand. Uh, but moving on, uh, the body. The author considers uh, the body to be an integral part of the soul. He uses the expression, uh, the medium through which we perceive everything around us. And this is quite consistent with most of pagan philosophy that does not make a distinction between what is spiritual, what is material. Both are components of a greater whole. They are integrated, or at least they should be. And of course, this also means that pagans do not see the flesh as something that is separate from their true selves or, you know, lower or lesser or undesirable in some way. Uh, next, we have the spirit, which is defined as the ethereal body, uh, that which is left over after the body dies. Uh, in the event that you happen to witness an apparition or a ghost, uh, what, according to the author, what is being observed is their ethereal spirit body. And it isn't a foregone conclusion that uh, ghosts of this kind are unhappy or tormented or have unfinished business or anything of that sort. Um, the impression that they always are and that's all that they can be is a result of just media, superstitions, that kind of stuff. Next, the haim. Uh, interestingly, the author describes the haim as the skin of the spirit, which serves the same function as our physical skin on our bodies and that, you know, it keeps what lies within it contained. Uh, the haim is comparable to the astral body, and it also bears striking similarities to my own personal views about auras, uh, being that they are the energetic outer layer of skin over your whole energy system. Uh, the haim will take the form of and will be a reflection of the person's physical body. Next, we have the fetch. Uh, this isn't considered by the author to be part of the spirit form, but is something that is connected to it. Or it's attached to it. Uh, moreover, the fetch is also considered to be sentient and a fully independent being, and that they might manifest as a human or an animal or something of that nature. The author claims that we are given at least two of these beings in life. Uh, Run is in the role of kind of a guardian, uh, frequently appearing in the form of the opposite sex, and the other is a totem animal. It is believed that the fetch attaches itself to children upon their ninth day of life, and then it remains with them throughout the whole uh, of their lives. Direct contact between individuals and the fetch seems to depend upon whether or not that person has magical talent or if they are in the moments right before their deaths when they might see their fetch. Uh, then we have the mind, which is the seat of the self. 
our identity composed of our emotions, imagination, intellect, as well as the source of our moods and will. This is the innermost per person interwoven and connected with all parts of itself, complex and surprising. Uh, it is the, the mind that is actually what we would think of as the heart of hearts from a heathen point of view. Then we have the memory. Uh, the memory is intimately connected to the mind. Uh, they're not quite interchangeable concepts, uh, but there is no one without the other. And the memory is thought to have two layers, the immediate memory and then the primal memory. The immediate memory is all that we have lived through and experienced and that we have learned in this incarnation. And there are, these are the things that are more readily accessible to us on a conscious level. But the primal memory is deeper and it tends to affect us more subconsciously or unconsciously. While our personal experiences become a part of that primal memory, it is but one thread in a larger tapestry. The primal memory could be considered uh, ancestral memory or collective memory. It might surface as intuitive nudges uh, that we would do well to take note of and act upon. Next, we have the wit. Coulter calls the wit the seat of perception. In short, it is all five of our physical senses. Not only does the wit enable us to take in information and the stimuli around us, but it is that which enables us to properly evaluate that and to understand what it all means. It's a processor of information as much as it is a data collector. Uh, then we have the will. This is our drive, the inner fire and the catalyst that gets us moving. The will is more instinctual, but it's also something that we can strengthen and train uh, much the way we would a physical muscle. This is our inspiration, our creativity, and our ability to follow through with our intentions. Uh, then we have the mood. The author described this as uh, the lesser passions and the sense that they are reactionary of the moment. I would describe the mood uh, as surface emotions, such as things that can have uh, a massive impact upon us. They can affect us in the future, but they don't always. It's just how we happen to be feeling at any given time. And how we handle those feelings determines whether the mood has short-term or long-term cons consequences for ourselves. Uh, and uh, this is something that's more readily under our conscious, albeit not complete control. But we do have some measure of agency here. And then we have the woad. Coulter defines the woad as the greater passions or the higher passions. This goes well beyond our immediate feelings or the soft nudgings of intuition. This is a state of being that is touched and connected to the divine. It's possibly the closest union between the gods or spirits and human beings while we are in corporeal form. It can be attained through altered states of consciousness. Uh, disciplined meditation is my preferred method and my strong recommendation. But, you know, I don't really want to get into any controversies about substances that are said to help or the rather dreary and ill-framed arguments about our ancestor did this, blah, 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 blah. I, I, I don't care. I don't care. The discipline and the practice of meditation can get people to where they need to go and at a pace that they are able to handle. I think it is healthier long term. And I am as entitled to my opinion on the subject as the people who disagree with me are entitled to theirs. Uh, so that does it for the chapter. And I think well, let's let's just give a round of applause for the author. For once, he did not drive me to within an inch of my patience. Uh, his writing style was less obnoxious than usual, so credit where credit is due. I knew he had it in him, and uh, here's hoping future chapters in the book are in a similar vein. Uh, next week, we will take a look at Chapter 8, Gods, Goddesses, and Divine Beings. Hope you'll be back for that. But in the meantime, uh, your reactions, questions, comments, uh, whatever it is you happen to be thinking in relation to the topic of this video, please let me know in the comments section, or better yet, come visit us on Gilded. There's a link to join Blackbird's Brew in the description box below, and you'd be very welcome there, and I'd be happy to have a more involved discussion. Uh, but that'll do it for now, and I'll see you next time. Bye.